Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So last time we looked at the threat response system in the mind, and today we're going to look at the threat response system in the body so we can understand the connection between the two. Trauma generally starts in the mind, so the mind perceive, takes incoming sensory information. So actually, quick overview. So the mind takes incoming sensory information. The there's certain parts of the brain, like the amygdala, that scan and the frontal lobe scan this information and determine is this a threat or not a threat. If it's not a threat, the information is directed towards memory stores and dealt with as such, and um, any information that's unnecessary is discarded. If it is labeled a threat, then the amygdala releases a hormonal response and releases a bunch of chemicals that then communicate to the body so that the body can also prepare for fight or flight. So today we're going to talk about the body response in relation to the response in the mind. So first off, impact of anxiety on operation of the body. So let's see what's going on and why. The body is flooded with chemicals, hormones that are catabolic, which means that they break the body down. So you don't want them occurring in large um, amounts for you know, long periods of time. It's kind of like in a car when you're driving a car and you see the you know the movies or the race cars that use the nitrous oxide or the NOS. That's something that's useful to give the car the ability to go faster for a short period of time. But if you were to keep pumping nitrous oxide into the engine system, the engine's going to break down. It's going to wear out and break down very quickly because it's not meant to handle that kind of stress for that period of time. So that's kind of what the flight or fight response is and what cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline and all those chemicals that are getting released, they're for that burst of increased abilities for a short period of time in order to fight or flight and survive. Adrenaline is released by the adrenal glands and it heightens our abilities so we are able to speed up our functions. That's, you know, you'll see in the movie where like, you know, the the kid gets stuck under the car and like the parent will lift the car up off the ground a little bit. I mean, that's not something that typically happens, but the body is being flooded with all these things so that it is able to maximize its abilities without concern about, you know, over, um, overreaching in its abilities or damaging the body because survival is number one. And when your child or your kin is under there, then that's, that's close enough to your own self for survival. So um, cortisol is a steroid, so it helps actually to maintain balance in their blood pressure. So what happens is the amygdala communicates to the hypothalamus because the amygdala determines that incoming information is a threat. So you now have a perceived threat or a real threat. If there's a line in front of you, you have a real threat. If there's no line in front of you and you just can't pay a bill or your car won't start, it's a perceived threat to your life. So the amygdala tells the hypothalamus, which releases CRH hormone. This communicates to the pituitary gland, which releases ACTH hormone, and this triggers the cortisol release. You don't really need to know that whole thing. It's just nice to have that in there just in case. Norepinephrine is similar to adrenaline, and it also comes from the adrenal glands, and it's a backup for the adrenaline. So when you hear about norepinephrine, that's what that is. It's kind of basically a backup to adrenaline. It just makes sure that we have enough reserves to survive this situation to fight or flight our way out of it, right? Many of the operations um, in the body are shut down. Digestion is shut down. And so this is because you don't need to process food when you're trying to fight or flight. So your body says, well, I'm going to take all energy from everywhere in the body that does not need this. And I'm going to redirect it to the fight or flight systems the muscles for explosive energy, parts of the brain so that I can, you know, work through this. So stomach issues are really common with people who deal with high anxiety stress or PTSD trauma. Um, they get ulcers a lot or, or um, you know, they'll have um, gastro, gastrointestinal issues and ED, electro, uh, um, erectile dysfunction, sorry, erectile dysfunction is common in men with high stress, high anxiety or trauma because the blood is redirected from that area to parts of the body that require it for fight or flight. So if you're in high stress, the um, the pelvic area, the penis, all that stuff is not going to receive the blood flow that it needs to to maintain an erection. So erectile dysfunction is commonly associated to high levels of stress. And if the stress is managed, then the, um, the dysfunction is, goes away. 
when you have increased regular frequency exposure to, to stress and anxiety, it, it greatly impacts your sleep, heart disease, increases your rates of obesity, mental illness, diabetes. There's just a list that goes on and on and on. Um, exposure to high levels of stress and anxiety on a regular basis is just detrimental to the not only the longevity of your life, but the quality of your life. And this is something that we mentioned briefly in a previous presentation on childhood trauma when we talked about ACEs, which is the adverse childhood experiences. Um, and those are things that can predict the likelihood of people experiencing this long list of issues later into their adulthood. The nervous system is basically sent into battle stations mode. So those of you who were especially specifically in the Navy will know this term, but it just means, you know, everything is redirected towards survival because that's number one because if you're not surviving nothing else matters you have to be alive so the nervous system is sent into battle stations mode which means it's shifted all the way over to one side to the extreme to the um, sympathetic nervous system side which is the side that triggers all the, the issues in the body so here's what happens in the body cognition is difficult and you can start to get a headache or feel pressure in the head. The head can feel heavy. The heart begins to pump harder and faster. This is because the body's trying to redirect the blood from all over the body to various parts of the body that are required for fight or flight, like the muscles. So this is also why you might feel chills or changes in heat temperature and extremities or parts of your body because the blood flow is changing so rapidly. Also, your blood vessels constrict or get smaller. And part of this is due to um, the body, you know, if you get hurt, damaged, you won't bleed out as fast, so you can have a longer chance for fight or flight. And also you might have some stuff going on with inflammation because the body is in a heightened state of awareness. So with inflammation, that could possibly impact that as well. The digestive system halts. We discussed this. So you might start to have issues with your stomach, especially over long term. This halts because you don't need to digest food, you need to survive. So all the energy used for digestion is gonna be redirected to survival. Focus becomes um, different, difficult, changes. You can get tunnel vision. You don't notice things in your peripherals. You're very hyper-focused on the forward. Well, this is kind of a, at our core animalistic thing. If there's a lion in front of you, you need to keep your attention on that lion 100%. You don't need to worry about the things surrounding you. It needs to be that lion in front of you, so your threat is in your vision and that's where your vision gets directed. Muscles can become tense, sore, or warm. This is due to change in blood flow. It's also, um, you're getting a lot of blood flow and things like that redirected to the muscles and they're getting, they're getting primed, so, right? So they're getting primed, ready for explosive energy to fight or flight. Your lungs start to go really fast, breathe harder, work harder, shallow breathing. This is because your body is told to pull in as much oxygen as possible because oxygen is what you need for fuel to move blood, to fuel your muscles, etc. All of this occurs when you perceive a threat. You perceive that there is a lion in front of you. It's all it takes. There doesn't have to be. If you open the door and there's a lion, you're going to have these symptoms occur. If you open the door and somebody hands you a note that says you're evicted, you have to be out by tomorrow, oh, by the way, you owe $30,000, you're going to have some or all of these just like if there was a line at the door. Our brains are not good at understanding the difference between a life threat and a social threat, especially when we struggle with trauma, PTSD, or an anxiety disorder. So a perceived threat is all you need. It doesn't have to be actually standing in front of you or real to other people. I mentioned in our last presentation, I believe, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the nerve that is basically responsible for the rest and digest system or to calm you. So it is the one that you would go to if you're in the sympathetic nervous system side of the nervous system because you're in anxiety mode. If you were to calm, you would go shift across that, um, that whole spectrum all the way over to the other side to the parasympathetic nervous system. The nerve that's responsible for regulating and running this is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs all over your body. It runs from up here in your skull and your head 
down through your ear to your larynx and pharynx in your throat, down to your heart, down to your stomach, and then it goes into your large and small intestines and your kidneys, your liver, and your spleen. So there are 12 cranial nerves in your body, which means nerves starting in the cranium. The vagus is the longest. It actually runs on both sides of your body, left and right, but the uh, right side has some interaction with another nervous system, part of your nervous system that regulates some operations of your heart. So when people do vagus nerve stimulation using a TENS unit, which is a transcutaneous um, nerve stimulation thing, so it uses electrical pulses to stimulate the nervous system, they hook it on their left ear on a couple of certain points because you can actually externally access the vagus nerve on a couple of those points in your ear to stimulate it, which has been shown to um, have you know positive benefits on one's ability to manage anxiety and stress and a bunch of other things. Um, I can't recall if we go into that in detail or not in here, but it is on my website. There's there's like three or four articles I wrote on that that detail that um, well and talk about the polyvagal theory, which we will go into. Um, there's two main components, the somatic and the visceral. So the somatic is sensations that felt, felt through the body on the skin and visceral are the sensations felt from the internal on the organs. Sensory functions, part of that, the somatic. Um, somatic information it comes in for parts of the throat and ears, which we talked about how the vagus nerve travels through that. Visceral information from the larynx, we said, right? The esophagus, the lungs, the trachea, heart, we talked about, and then things in the digestive tract like the small and large intestines, etc. There's a small role that it plays in the sensation of taste at the roof of your mouth. And so there is a couple case studies where I've heard of people having anxiety issues that started later in life and they didn't understand where they came from. And they actually had um, a procedure done that had caused that. Motor functions would be things that help to stimulate muscles in your throat. There's also a connection to parts of the roof of the mouth stimulate muscles in your heart which helps lower your your heart rate stimulates the digestion tract so that helps turn on the digestion system again after you've been activated uh, get the stomach acids flowing again get the intestines working so it turns on those motor functions that help the body to start operating at full speed again once you're out of that fight or flight battle stations mode if the vagus nerve is damaged um, or if it becomes dysregulated, it can lead to so many things, anything from heartburn and constipation all the way to severe anxiety and panic attacks and everything in between, fatigue, muscle weakness and pain throughout the body, stomach issues, heart issues, you know, there's, it's just, the list is, is very long. It's kind of like the thyroid. The thyroid is, um, it's got its hands in everything. Uh, Vasa vagal syncope is something where if it becomes overstimulated to a certain degree, somebody can actually faint. So the uh, vagus nerve can be so responsive to certain incoming sensory information that it can cause the person to, to pass out. Um, there's actually a medical procedure. So I mentioned the TENS unit, the trans, uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulation unit which you can get those for about 40 bucks, by the way. And I use one um, every day at work while I'm just kind of doing notes. I just pop it on for about 20 minutes. But anyways, they actually have a medical procedure where they can install something that's like that. And they like, they, uh, they, they take the wire and they wrap it around, basically connect it to the vagus nerve. And then it has a little device that just constantly sends little electrical pulses to the vagus nerve to stimulate it and help balance it out. The vagus nerve is responsible for your calm system, parasympathetic. So it lowers your blood pressure, turns on your stomach again, and your digestive system, lowers your heart rate, decreases feelings of your of anxiety, etc. So let's talk about vagus nerve health, taking care of it. There's various, numerous ways that you can stimulate the vagus nerve in a positive way, which helps it to become better at staying healthy, helping you manage anxiety. Foods that contain high bacteria, good bacteria like probiotics. So yogurt, Greek yogurt, kombucha tea, which is a fermented tea, and then high fiber foods, magnesium, sodium, omega-3s. Those are all foods that can help with tuning the vagus. Um, tuning means basically to do things that help it 
be healthier. That's what tuning means. Vocal exercises, so seeming, singing, humming, chanting. If you're driving in the car, just sing along. Um, you, people, some people who practice meditation will do ohm chanting or they'll just do chanting or humming. That's because that's part of a vagus nerve toning. They may or may not know why they're doing it, but that's part of it besides the spiritual piece for them. Um, even yelling, grunting, so singing, all that stuff. Cold is also a very good stimulation for the vagus nerve. So what I'll do very simply is I'll just, when I'm done taking a shower in the morning, I just turn the shower to as cold as it'll go for about 30 seconds to a minute. And I just let that run over me, um, my face, my ears, you know, my neck, just wherever. Um, it also helps kind of to wake me up anyway. So not my favorite part of the day, but easy to do and it adds to this stacking method where if you do these little things together for for a consistent period of time they begin to actually make a difference so taking a cold shower even drinking some ice water um, filling a bowl with water and ice and dipping your face into it for a few seconds at a time that's really good for helping with panic or anxiety attacks too for some people um, getting a massage or going to the chiropractor actually helps it can release pinching on the nerves of the vagus uh, nerve it can get out of whack um, or it can have tension due to inflammation, pain, muscles, you know, muscle tension, etc. And then good old yoga and stretching. I know everybody says every day we need to be doing more of this. It's because it has so many positive benefits to it. It really helps open the body up and decreases tension and inflammation in the body. Just kind of gets all the kinks out. And then there's also the energy flow aspect to it, like chi and stuff like that. If if you're in this more, I I say more spiritual side, but there is you know, scientific evidence that helps support this idea too. So the polyvagal theory is an approach that we can use to understand trauma or anxiety in the body. And the three main areas that we're gonna look at are co-regulation, neuroception, and then the hierarchy of how the threat response system functions. So co-regulation, which is biological, our autonomic nervous system, so our nervous system is always searching for signs of safety and danger. We are always looking for threat versus no threat because at our core, as mammals, survival is number one. It, it, it overshadows social connection. There are times when people can try and fight through and battle that. There is no guaranteed. But at our core, surviving is before all else. There's a, um, if you look at kangaroos, I found this out a long time ago and it was kind of interesting. If a kangaroo is running from a threat, if the kangaroo perceives that it can't get away, then that survival response takes over. And it will actually take, if it has a joey, which is a baby kangaroo in its pouch, it'll take that joey and it'll throw it on the ground and, and hurt it so that the predator will stop and take the joey and allow the kangaroo, the mom or whatever, to get away. When you hear that, it sounds terrible, but when you think about it, the the kangaroo absolutely believes that it's going to be caught. So it and the baby are gonna die. So instead, the baby dies and the kangaroo lives and then the kangaroo mom can then have more babies, continue to procreate, evolve, etc., cetera, survival. Um, there's this issue with us, this state of evolutionary drive versus you know, social human need to connect. So we have this animalistic as a mammal to survive, but then we have this humanistic drive as a social creature to connect with other humans. You know, when you have a good conversation with somebody or you hug, you have this interaction with other humans, that is the main mechanism for releasing oxytocin, which would be, I guess, identified as that chemical that kind of gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling, right? We are wired to experience pleasure when we interact pleasurably with other human beings because whatever you believe created us wanted us to connect with one another we are social creatures okay but we are also driven to survive at our core animalistic nature so this can make it difficult to interact with others in social settings when they're strangers because technically strangers are threatening to us because they are unknowns cues occur between us when we speak with you know interpersonal interactions if we can have these cues and the other person has these cues and we can kind of co-regulate with one another 
you know, we can get on the same page with one another. We can seek new possibilities and connections with people that we don't know. We can expand our social system, our social settings. This is something that is highly impacted by um, attachment theory, which we'll discuss. Oh, we discussed that before with the, with, uh, the presentation on child trauma. So in attachment theory, there's those four main attachment theories that you can develop. This is part of that. You know, uh, us learning through a household that's, you know, very disorganized or a mom or a dad that's very unpredictable, that makes it difficult for us to be able to co-regulate with others later in life. Because So we, we often can sense them as still dangerous, and so we can't get that drive for connection with them. Um, so when you do have an increased reactivity to others because of past trauma especially, it reinforces these habitual behaviors of avoidance and survival trumps social connection, which is not good for us as a human species and can lead to all kinds of issues, depression, mental illness, isolation, etc. Next, we have neuroception. This is the sense that we can detect things without even knowing that we're detecting them. So our body can sometimes know things before our mind even activates or, or informs us of this information. Sometimes people might say, listen to your gut. Well, there's a scientific basis to that on some level. The autonomic nervous system can take in the information from sensory input without even involving the brain. So our nervous system can actually have a sensory reaction to information before our brain has even had a chance to process information itself. Am I safe? Am I in danger? This, the nervous system will then respond to whichever you answer. If there's a mismatch in neuroception, which means a disconnect with the mind-body, there is a repeated difficulty or inability to calm yourself, to activate the vagus nerve or the parasympathetic nervous system, the calm side of your nervous system. And this can lead to hypervigilance, which is um, the best analogy, uh, you know, walking around with your head on a swivel, that, that kind of feeling where you always, you feel like you get to look over your shoulder. Like you just went to prison for the first time in your life, right? Um, it also gives us, it enforces this inability to activate our defense systems. Um, so we can actually go the high opposite way where we're hypo vigilant, which means very, very under non-responsive. And this can lead to risky behaviors because we just don't um, really take in the significance of how dangerous certain things can be or how scary certain things can be. So you can hyper respond or you can hypo respond. Next is the hierarchy. And so this is the predictable pathways that we have in responding to threat. First, you have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calm system. This is the, this is split. Okay. So ventral vagal, this is when we feel a sense of social connection and safety. We feel balanced. Our mind and our body are connected. They're on the same page and we feel regulated. We're kind of at that homeostasis level. Then you have the sympathetic nervous system, which is the flight or fight system. So flight or fight is activated. So there's a threat. We go into the sympathetic nervous system. Then you can actually go back to the parasympathetic to something called the dorsal vagal. This is the freeze response. This is a basic core survival instinct that comes basically out of our hind brain, that amphibian brain, that basic dummy brain, and it is a shutdown mode. So our brain basically says, you can't fight this. You can't flight from this. I'm shutting it down. We're going to save energy. We're going to disconnect you from experiencing how traumatic this is going to be. And it also might allow you to escape, right? Play possum, play dead, etc. So you go through the ventral vagal when you're calm, get activated into the sympathetic nervous system. And if you get overly activated to where it's just like short circuits your whole brain and body because it's just beyond understandable or beyond survival, this activates the dorsal vagal. And this is the human versus animal stuff that we're dealing with. You have a need for connection with other humans, but at your core as an animal, strangers are dangerous doesn't really make it very fun for us. Here is references to Porges, who is the um, creator of the polyvagal theory, and then Vanderkolk's Body Keeps the Score, 
basically everything that I just talked about came out of that book. Again, the mind has information coming in from the outside world. It scans and says threat or not threat, not a threat, send it over to the parts of the brain to process it as memories, discard the, the stuff I don't need. If it is a threat, trigger certain hormones in the brain into the body. The body then triggers the, is then triggered from one side to the other in the nervous system. That creates a bunch of responses in the body, redirecting blood flow, um, you know, priming your muscles for fight or flight, etc. And then you're off to the races with fight or flight. If your body and brain perceive that you cannot escape or cannot fight off the threat, you go into basic animal survival, hypo, you just freeze, you shut down, play possum. And the overarching issue with this whole process is animal versus human. We are a mammal, but we are also a human, a social human. And there is this complicated uh, discord, conflict between our animal nature to survive at all costs and our human nature to connect. I hope this was useful for you. I know it's a lot of information. If you want to read about it more, these are all gonna be posted on my website shortly, but there's also articles that I wrote and some videos that I've pointed people to that really talk about this, the polyvagal theory, etc. So there's plenty more information for you to really absorb this. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or you think some of it was BS, please comment. Um, well, just contact me. I don't know if there will be a comment box for this up or not, but contact me through my website, www.theanxiousmammal.com. With this presentation, maybe now you guys see where I got that um, name from. We are mammals and we do run anxious because of our human nature. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please reach out and let me know. And I will start working on the next presentation, which I'm not sure what that one is, but from here on out, I find them to be pretty interesting because we did get the core kind of scaffolding knowledge taken care of that we need to talk about the good stuff. Thank you.